Uh, Brent kicked us off in uh, uh, this Jesus Unfiltered um, series. We're going to continue with that for a while up to our Advent time. And, and I love the, the little line that he started off with. I asked him this week, did you intend for that to be the line? And he said yes. And that was to experience Jesus as the disciples did. And I want to do that. I was just in Israel. So it is an incredible thing to walk on stones, to go to places. And I can, I can tell you 100%, this is a stone. That is a place that Jesus stood on, touched, was at. So it means even more to me to experience. I was able to do that maybe a little more than some of you, to experience Jesus as the disciples did 2,000 years ago. And what we're talking about are things that are more off the grid from what we would normally look at with Jesus. Today, I want to talk about zeal. This one line in the story that we'll look at in just a little bit, it's Jesus, uh, he doesn't necessarily say it, but the disciples notice it, and it's this. It says, zeal for your house consumes me. Zeal for your house consumes me. Does this matter to us, to have zeal, to have passion? I'll look at the definition in just a moment. And in light of that, what should we do? Especially in our times today as we come up to a political season again, it just never ends as we talk about all the aspects of our world. I just got gassed this morning, and I'm like, it costs what? Right? Right? We're going to see more zeal come out of people than ever before. We've seen that for years now with all the things that have gone on. I was just in a place where I experienced it in ways that are hard to even imagine sometimes. Three faiths coming together in one small area. It's filled with people with passion and zeal. Here's what zeal means. Uh, in your notes on this slide, let me walk through it with you a little bit to talk about what we're, we're talking about today and maybe how it looks for us and point out a few things. And you can have some great discussions in your small group. If you haven't joined a small group, you should. If you want to go to heaven, join a small group. I'm just making sure that you are. I don't believe that, so don't tweet that or what, you know, post it on Instagram. Ron said, I'm just kidding, but it is important to us. It does matter and make a difference. These would be great discussion topics for you in your small groups. Men will talk about it on Thursday mornings at 6 a.m. Men, zeal means this. It's excessive fervor to do something or accomplish some end, right? That's passion, energy, enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or an objective. So you can already think about all the ways, good and bad, what that means. The bad part of it also means this. When you look at the biblical definition of zeal, It's deeper, it seems, than passion. It also has to do with envy and jealousy, which is very interesting. Envy and jealousy. One commentator wrote that that is its behavior motivated by the jealous desire to protect oneself, group, space, time, against violations. So it's envy or jealousy for something. Sometimes we can even see that play out in other areas of life where you are jealous for something and you have so much zeal, passion, that you want to get to that place, grab that person, do whatever it is. And the heart of it, what's behind it, is envy and jealousy. The other thing that I thought was interesting in the biblical definition of it, and definition as a whole, this makes sense to me, I never thought about it, but it's to boil over. So the idea is that this passion, this zeal, this excessive fervor, this energy, this enthusiasm that is inside of me at some point, good or bad, will boil out of me. It's interesting because I just read to you about Jesus Something that is written in Psalm 69, we'll get there in a minute, but let me just say it now. It says, zeal for your house, it consumes me. We know that maybe that means eats at me. We also know what that does when it's good or bad. Envy, jealousy, other things, bad. 
that eats at you until finally you do something that you might regret, that you can't believe you did, something in a nature that's more around violence or force. And that's when it's, we'll talk about this for a minute as well, when it's misguided and misdirected zeal. In the Bible, the term was a zealot. They wanted to force, from a spiritual standpoint, force a Messiah upon the people. Violently. We also knew back in the time of Jesus when you heard zealot, and he had a zealot as one of his disciples. One of the original 12 was Simon, in some translations, the zealot. We don't know if that was his passion for religion, passion for God, or passion because he wanted the Messiah to be pushed upon, and Jesus had to deal with this by force. I don't even know that things have necessarily changed dramatically in some way in the depth of it, 2,000 years later. That there are things that we do even as a church that could be seen more not as a good, healthy zeal for God, but as something negative, violent, forceful. I mean, in our history of Christianity is the Crusades. We will force you to follow God. I just said some form of zeal, joking as it was, but pastors like me use things like this with some sort of zeal that I have to place it upon you, and we use it as shame or guilt to get you to do something, to give, to serve, to join a small group. And if it comes out of just me to get numbers, that's envy and jealousy. Now, if it's for a purpose and passion for Jesus, that's different maybe. But a zealot was misguided, misdirected zeal. I wonder, just keep thinking with me, what's your zeal? And we're talking about zeal in following God now. Is there anything misguided, misdirected? You'll see what Jesus does when he responds to these things in just a moment. In Israel, I experienced it many times. Zeal walking down the old city in the Arab quarter, open late at night, wanting to see the wall. And uh, I love walking down there. And I walk down to pray, but on the way, it is the zeal and passion of shopkeepers to pull you into their shop. That they will say things that are almost comical. Uh, about me, what they notice of me. Maybe it's something I'm wearing. My buddy Matt had a 49ers. He forgot that he had the 49ers hat on. Don't let that get you all passionate about your team now. If you hate the 49ers or love them, there's a whole form of zeal, right? And they will say stuff to you. They're, they're just trying to entice you with their zeal to sell something into their shop. And some of it's so ridiculous. You're like, that didn't, I'm, man, I, you got to do better than that, right? But, and then as you, as you go down these alleyways and paths, you come into a giant open arena, one of the most zealous-filled places on earth when it comes to religion, the Temple Mount. I was there on Rosh Hashanah. It's the, the Jewish New Year. Thousands and thousands of people in this small area. The tension is high because everybody wants this plot of land for themselves. So much so that their zeal would cause them to do violent things, forceful things. And then you see people praying at the wall with great zeal for the Messiah to come. And it is, it is hard to watch because you stand there believing that you have a relationship with the Messiah. And yet here are people dancing and singing and moving and praying with passion for one to come. And you pray and say, God, open their eyes to the truth of who Jesus is. Man, there's so much behind that. Does all this matter to us today? And my belief is yes, what should we do in light, when we read the story of Jesus and his zeal, what should we do in light of this 
passion that he shows us, that his disciples experienced. First, let me tell you that we can lack in zeal. This is Revelation 3, 15 and 16. It's in your notes as well. You can write little things down. I'd love to hear feedback from it because we're not going to share all this stuff today. And next week, maybe I'll share a few more things about my trip and what it means for you in a little bit today as well. But Revelation 3, 15 and 16 is written to the church. It's the last book of the Bible. It's written to the church by the writer to express something to this church about something that is lacking. I wonder if anyone connects with it in here. Does it resonate with your heart when it says, I know all the things that you do. And this isn't just to an individual, but also to a church. I know all the things that you do that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but since you are lukewarm, water, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. That's kind of harsh. And what is the writer writing to the church? He's saying you lack zeal. And he even says, you know what? Just have zeal for something. I mean, definitely we want to be hot. That's a weird thing to say to you guys this morning. But hot for the Lord? I don't know. That doesn't make sense, does it? But take that as you will. But man... This lukewarm thing, kind of lacking zeal. I think there's a lot of Christians around that don't fully embrace what Christ has done for them and the power of that, and it drives them to nothing. And quite honestly, relationship with God is boring. Who cares, you know? And it just, it does nothing for you. It's not consuming you. It's not boiling out of you because there's not a whole lot going on, and that's not to anyone in here. If anything, it's to me to evaluate my life, but the writer writes and says, I'd like a church that was hot for Jesus, passionate about him, understanding that he died for you, that he was driven to death on the cross for sin because you matter. Sometimes though, we we want to talk about this for a minute Zeal can be misdirected and misguided. I already shared that with you concerning the zealots. But I really term this as a zeal apart from Jesus. Extreme views and actions, especially in following a particular political or religious belief. Jesus' teachings and actions seem to be opposite of the zealots. The zealots are going to punch the Roman dude in the face. And Jesus' words were what? I want you to turn the other cheek. It feels to me, especially around religion, this is what really what we're talking about, that we feel that we should be ready in some way to punch somebody in the face. That that's zeal for God. This touches, this touches and, and you're going to have to evaluate this some. I'm not going to give you all the answers today on nationalism. Where suddenly we care more about our nation, and don't get me wrong, I'm an American, man. <laughs> but we care more about that than God himself. And somehow I think it should flip. We should care about our nation 100%. But you know what? As a follower of Jesus, my king is Jesus. This is what we're talking about. This is the kind of zeal that he shows. Especially now, let's put it in the context of church and religion. Misguided, misdirected. Romans 10, 1 through 3. Dear brothers and sisters, Paul would write to the Roman church, The longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. I long for that today. It's why I went. It's why we support certain ministries. I want all people of Israel, not just Jews or Arabs, all people there to be saved. I know what enthusiasm they have for God. But here's what Paul says. 
And you'll see something about him in a little bit. It's misdirected zeal. Why? For they don't understand God's ways of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. And you know what? There's a lot of things in the church that hasn't changed for 2,000 years. That Jesus becomes a little bit down here, but we think keeping the law is more important than following Jesus. When I was at the hotel with my two friends, Matt and Steve, two other pastors from Virginia, uh, the Sabbath came. And they're entering, they're right now in the, the, the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. I won't go into all that, but it's happening right now. I think it just begins. It's a big, high, holy time for the nation of Israel. And they get serious about it. Yom Kippur just happened for 24 plus hours. That place is shut down. No driving, no nothing. Steve sent me some pictures just walking down the middle of highways. Nothing's open. You better buy some food ahead of time. All, it's just crazy to think that they could do this. But this time is coming. A father sent these three girls. To me, it looked like they were, you know, high schoolers. I'm like, I don't know what dude, dad, would send three high school girls to Israel on their own. I'm sure they were a lot older, but I'm getting old. I can't tell age and time anymore half of the time. And here's what was interesting to me. You see the seriousness, the zeal for religion and the law. I think misguided and misdirected, but still I appreciate the zeal. They check in at the hotel, and it's a tight little area where the elevator's right here. Here's the front desk, so you have to pass all this. You hear the conversation. The conversation is this to the guy at the front desk. When this starts, the Sabbath, are you going to come out behind? They're asking him this, and they are serious about this. Are you going to come out behind the desk and press the buttons in the elevator so that we don't have to because it's against the rules, the law? To have that kind of zeal because you think God will love you more if you don't press elevator buttons seems crazy to me. But not to them. I appreciate their zeal. Whatever they're doing with it, Paul says it's misdirected zeal and it comes out of his love for his people. That he wants them to see Jesus in it all and he's going to experience that himself. I'll read it in just a moment. You know what I need to evaluate is do we do that to ourselves in the church today? Is there anything that you do that we do that we have put above God because we think if we do it more, we always talk about like Bible reading, going to church, joining a small group, praying. That if you do it the right way enough amount of times, then God is going to give you greater rewards, a greater place, as opposed to having a love relationship with the Savior who died for your sins and gave you new life. I wonder if we do anything like that. Paul goes on to talk in places in just a moment. I'll hit Philippians, but first Galatians, and then he'll repeat it in Philippians. He says, you know what? I was like when I followed the Jewish religion, how I violently persecuted God's church. I did my best to destroy it. I was far ahead of my fellow Jews in my zeal for the traditions of my ancestors. In Philippians 3, you got to read the whole chapter. It is awesome, but here's verse 6, 7. I was so zealous, Paul wrote to the church, the Philippian church. He says, I was so zealous, I was so passionate, so enthusiastic that I harshly persecuted the church. I killed them. And as far as righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. But then he says this. This is the beauty. This is what we're talking about. This is where we're going. This is what matters. This is where we make a difference. I once thought these things were valuable. But now, Listen to the beauty of his words, the depth, the passion. I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. His zeal flipped, it changed. I wonder what you're zealous about, what you're committed to, dedicated to. Is there anything misguided or misdirected? And then out of this, what do we do? How do we act? 
What are we supposed to do with what we'll see in just a moment Jesus is doing? This zeal is going to come from, as we look at it deeper, it's not in your notes, you can write it down on your own, but zeal comes from a desire. My desire for God to please and follow and obey him. Not out of force. Not because somebody told me God's going to love me more if I do it, but, but out of love. An understanding of what Christ has done that comes from a desire that is birthed within me. Out of that I make a decision to stay on mission, to follow God, to obey him. Even though sometimes I make wrong decisions, I come back to him. Even though I go the wrong way and promote the wrong thing, I'm turning back to him. And then out of that desire and decision making, I find myself in this point where zeal is consuming me inside and driving us to keep going. Past what? Fear, distractions, compromise, criticism, control of people. This comes from Jesus. I said, what does it come from? It's Titus 2.14. Look at what he writes in Titus 2.14. He says, he gave Jesus his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and to make us his very own people. That's identity. Who am I? I'm his. Totally committed to doing good deeds. In one translation, that means zealous for good works. So in light of what Jesus has done, he gives me this drive, this passion, this desire, and it turns into a desire to do good works. Not good works to appease God and get to heaven, but good works necessary to do, yes, but it comes out of a zeal for what Christ has done for me. That's important. You as a church... Though I have not done a good job at informing you of all the things you do, this goes back 20 years for me, some of these people. Three things happen in the Middle East, in Israel in particular, that you give to, that some of your monthly giving goes to. Diana Bridge to Jerusalem, a moon sling from the Domari Center, this wonderful, incredible woman who helps other gypsy women and children rise up out of this, the deep persecution that they have suffered to become something greater than they could ever imagine. And Allah from Makase, who helps Holocaust survivors. Some of you saw the pictures of me eating some weird gelled fish that I almost had to beg God to help me with to, you know, just other things in their homes. You give... This is, this is something that I hope that you can grasp a little bit of. You give to not just ministries, but when I say the ministry's name, Domari Center, Makase, Bridge to Jerusalem, it's attached to a person. You give your money to help Holocaust survivors, gypsy women and children in deep darkness. You give to Diana Help in various ways, Arab, Jew, to help people find Jesus, you give zealously to zealous people who are passionate about others finding Jesus. Who will work through all the distractions and finances and complications and criticisms. You know, you guys gave a chunk of money to a moon because just months ago, Right outside the Domari Center that I was just at two weeks ago. Somebody with a, diff, a zeal of envy, jealousy against her. She walks out of her building because she smells something burning. And they had burnt her car to the ground. But because she loves these women and children so much, she is zealous about them knowing Jesus, even though it may take years for someone to come to Christ. That's zeal and passion because it's something bigger. We give to zealous people to do the work that they are zealous about, especially when it comes to people finding Jesus. Jesus was zealous. 
all throughout the Bible in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, as a boy in God's house when his parents couldn't find him. And he says, why did you need to search? Didn't you know that I must be about my father's business in my father's house? He's always going after God's people, even though he was criticized. He didn't care that he wasn't supposed to touch. Religion wouldn't stop him. He did it anyways because he was passionate about why he came Nothing would distract him. He was intentional in his passion about his life's mission. I stood in a place, and I remembered in Luke 9.51, when he suddenly knew, and it seemed like this was the area where it was happening concerning the stories, It says he knew it was time to go die, so he resolutely, with zeal, set out for Jerusalem, knowing that he he would face extreme criticism, anger, hatred, and death. But he was intentional in his passion about his life's mission. Nothing could stand in the way of his purpose to be Savior to all people and have a relationship with you, and me. He was also, this is the tough part for a lot of us, he was confrontational when it came to distracting from his mission and purpose. Jesus seemed to attack the temple, something held in the highest regard by the Jews, and still is today. I was just there. Maybe some of you saw the pictures. They don't even do it justice. But actually, This is where we got to be careful about how we act today with certain things in the name of God. But actually, he was attacking the purpose of the temple, something the religious had corrupted. Most of his confrontation was with who? The religious. Brent brought that up last week. Here's the story. John 2, 13 and 17. He's just beginning his ministry in a lot of ways. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover. It's around Easter time. So Jesus went to Jerusalem. He's done this before. He did it as a boy that I just mentioned just a moment ago. And uh, he goes to Jerusalem. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus then this is, the, this is the tough part, man. This excites some of you. Some of us dudes are like, yeah, I'm walking out of here today. Where's the cords? I'm going to make a whip. I'm going to fix this world, this nation. We're going to take care of it, right? <laughs> he makes some ropes, he, uh, and he chases them out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and the cattle. This must have been a sight, too, man. He scattered the money changers. He threw their coins all over the floor. He turned over their tables. Then, going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, get these things out of here. Stop turning. Here it is. This is where we got to refocus after we just got pumped up about kicking some rear ends. Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. There, there's one of the principles right there. It's my father's house. Something bigger going on here, deeper going on. It's something driving me that's not just fixing things. Then as disciples, they remember this prophecy. It's from Psalm 69.9. need to read the whole thing. It's beautiful, but it says passion, zeal for God's house. It'll consume me. Like it's really cool because they remembered a prophecy about the Messiah who was promised to come and they attached it to Jesus. Passion for God's house will consume me. When this, when Jesus did this, it was a declaration of war. That would bring suffering and insult. For the whole Psalm 69, 9 says, Passion for God's house will consume me, and the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. He knew that this zeal and passion would bring insult and persecution. 
They recognized Jesus in that. But Jesus, intentionally zealous and confrontational when it came to these things that's in your notes. And I think this is where I should be intentionally zealous and at times confrontational. Now, that's something we can debate about and talk about. It's a great small group question. Here it is in your notes with some blanks. Right, fill it in. Number one, when should I be this zealous concerning following Jesus when it distorts the gospel of God? The gospel is the good news of Jesus, that he came, died for my sin, rose from the grave, and each one of you and I and the globe people can have a relationship with God. When something distorts the gospel in the scriptures, Jesus was confrontational about it. Mainly with the religious. That's why it's mainly with the religious. They were pulling away, people away from the gospel. There was no good news in always needing to press elevator buttons. Every time it distorts the gospel of God, Jesus stood up. And he was zealous about the gospel. When it came to going into communities, touching people, healing folks, connecting with folks. Two, when it disconnects people from a relationship with God. Every time people were disconnected by religion, especially the religious, from God, Jesus went in and tried to pull them to God. I just did a camp at, uh, in this Moshav, this tiny community with armed guards and barbed wire fence around it in the middle of the West Bank, in the middle of nowhere down in the Jordan Valley. It was the most, the, the weirdest experience for me because I picked up and some mom put four seventh grade girls in my car to drive them for an hour and a half. What parent would put four seventh grade girls in a car in the Middle East to go to the West Bank with me. She took my picture. I'm sure it was like, I'm going to record this in case something. Said, I think I know you. And I said, maybe it's, you know, something from a long time ago because of me being there for so long. And I drove them, and they were just like seventh grade girls here. I think I texted my wife and said, what in the world is happening how do you do this five days a week? Because she teaches middle school. <laughs> when I got there, I found out that I was speaking two times at this camp. I didn't know that. And I talked both times about Zacchaeus. How Jesus wanted a guy that was hated, short, couldn't get close to him, was pushed away from him, and a massive crowd as Jesus walked through the community, but because of the gospel, and because people are supposed to be drawn to him, he stopped and he said, Zacchaeus, as Zacchaeus climbed a tree just to catch a glimpse of this man, who was no man at all, and said, today, I'm going to eat at your house. Every time the gospel is distorted and, dis and, and, and it disconnected people from a relationship with God, Jesus steps in. Confrontational, with zeal intentional. The temple was supposed to and is still supposed to be a place where people can learn and experience God together. Church. Journey Church is not for the holy ones. Because if it is, I shouldn't be allowed to be here. The only good in me is Jesus. So when Jesus saw people disconnected, Mark would write in one of the Gospels in this story, he would say, my temple will be called a house of prayer, and I love this little line, for all nations. The same story. Mark would write those words in there. But you've turned it into a den of thieves. 
It's for all people. The religious were keeping people away from God. Jesus connects them. Three, when it dishonors the character of God. It's where a lot of us might have a lot of tension, but we need to learn more about the character and nature of God. It's why I stand for life. It's why I think it matters. That's why I think it makes a difference what we do when we take a stand. Why? Is it because I just think something's right? No, I think it goes against the character and nature of God if we don't. Now, how that's displayed, what's said from a stage, how we act in the community, it's a whole different conversation. But anything that dishonors the character and nature of God, Jesus stood up for. He represented God on earth. He was God himself on earth to us. So he showed us what God was like by the way he lived, by the people he loved. I think that matters in the way we live and love. Four, when it distracts from the mission of God. He had a mission. It says he resolutely set out. Man, he was all about going to the cross for our sin, then going to the grave, then raising from that grave and giving us new life. Anything that would distract him from the mission of God, he was against. He fought through all the things to get to the place where he needed to be. It's why Luke 9.51 says he, he knew it was time, so he resolutely, with his face pointed in the right direction, nothing would stop him, would head towards Jerusalem to die for us. And the last one is this, when it divides people from the purposes of God. I think people still today are confused about the real purpose of the Passover, about the temple, Jesus attacks this idea of social injustice concerning the money and money changers that were there. This matters. Anytime that people were divided from the purposes of God, identity, this is why identity matters. The deeper things. This is why we take a stand in certain areas and issues. Because it goes against the purposes of God. And it divides people. So all this matters and makes a difference for us today because we're going to deal with it more and more, and it's not going anywhere. We're going to have to figure this out together. So how do we show zeal? Let me give you a few things real quick. One, with resolute commitment in our convictions. I think we need to have a resolute commitment to the things that God holds in great value to our convictions about what that is. We're resolute in our commitment with it just as Jesus was. Two, it's compassion and confrontation. We should be confrontational, but it comes with compassion. Jesus did that. He was very confrontational, but you can see over and over again when he was, there was a heart in there of compassion and then grace and correction. So we are going to have to be corrected and correct sometimes, and I think we need to have grace and give grace in it. Right after this story, there's going to be a guy that comes to Jesus, one of the religious. He comes at night. He's one of the guys that Jesus would stand against, speak against, be confrontational to, but the guy is seeking and searching. And Jesus is committed to the things that matter the most to him and to God. But he's compassionate to this guy. He tells him the truth and he shows him grace, gives him opportunity. Romans 12, 9 through 11. Listen, all of Romans 12, read it. I, I, I said that about Philippians 3, but then Romans 12, read this. It lays out how we act, and in the midst of it talks about zeal. Here's verses 9 through 11 from the NIV. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. These are biggies. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal. But keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. And then he just goes on to talk even more about what that looks like. And here is the biggie. I believe that zeal points people to Jesus. I believe that my compassion, and I wonder, is your passion pointing people to Jesus? Your passion for God. There's passion for other things that you can have, and maybe it's just stuff. It's fun. It's whatever. But I'm talking about following Jesus. 
Is my passion pointing people to Jesus? The worship team can come. We're going to sing a song. We're going to, if you have communion, you can take communion to remember this great thing. But here's what I want to wrap up with. There's something, like, we need to be zealous about following Jesus, but Jesus, it's in your notes there, is zealous about you. This is what drove him. He cares about a person more than a place. Why did it bother him about the temple so much? Because it was a piece of rock that he just loved more than anything else? No, it was because it was supposed to be a place about people. Even you can look throughout Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, the whole Bible, you find God is jealous for his people and purposes. Jesus, in the next verses after this, 18 through 22, will talk to the Jewish leaders because they say, why are you doing this? Why did you just kick out all of our stuff? Why did you overturn our tables? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. And he goes, all right, I'll show you a sign. Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up again. And they're like, what are you talking about? That's crazy talk. You're nuts. It took 46 years to build this temple. But Jesus was talking about him being the temple. That's why all this points to Jesus. His disciples saw that later on. They remembered these things. Jesus is the temple. But here's what's interesting too. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 6, other scriptures in the Bible call us a temple. Don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself for God bought you with a high price it's what you remember in communion today. It's what we talked about in Titus. It's why Jesus was driven towards people. He bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body for listen. You know what he calls you? A temple. You know what Jesus is zealous about? He's zealous about you. You and I drove him to the cross. It's weird to say. We drove him to death. But he was so consumed it ate at him so much. His love for you and me that nothing could stop him. That's what the gospel is. That's why people matter. Because you matter. When Jesus looked at that plot of ground that is still there today, that is a place of contention, I think he saw an element of himself. He saw an element of what matters most, and he saw an element of you and I, a piece of you and I there. Does this matter that we have zeal today? Yes, it does. Because people matter. Because you matter. Would you stand with me? If you have not given your life to Jesus today, Maybe this is the day that you do. To begin to grasp and understand just in a few moments here, it's really hard to do in a sermon like this, but to grasp this idea that, that Jesus would do anything to bring you into a relationship with God so much that he would go to die, it just that's where I want to grasp, I want to understand even more. That, that kind of love that he has for you. That nothing would stop him. Nothing would distract him from that. And to have that kind of zeal for others too is what I want. Maybe you do too. Maybe you have that. There are so many things in my life that distract me. There are so many other things that I have more zeal for than God himself that sometimes I just forget the beauty and power of what he's done for me. And when suddenly it comes back to me in a song, in a sermon, in a conversation, in a journey to another land, and I see the beauty of what he has done and how he is doing it, and the, empower, the, the power behind it and how much people matter to him and the life transformation that has happened in people, it drives me 
past, all the things that seem to complicate my life. Some things don't even matter as much anymore. They matter, but not as much as Jesus. So today, and if you have not given your life to Jesus, it starts right there. Hey, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I want to I wanna understand that love that you have for me, that you would die for me. Like, I matter that much to you. Forgive me of sin, Father. So much sin separates me from you, but forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, for I need you. God, I've been consumed by things that, are, that matter, that can make a difference, but not in comparison to what you have done. So forgive me, Father. Remind me constantly in beautiful ways the love that you have for me, the love that you have for us, the love that you have for your people. And today, Father, if there is someone who wants to surrender their life to you, then I pray that they do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's